And I have the pleasure of talking to the amazing Alex Kerr. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining again. It's great to be back. <laughs> and since we talked the last time, I have had the pleasure to stay at your beautiful Chiodi house. And I and my sister, we felt like we were hearing you talk while we were staying there. Every part of the house, we just kept wandering around and hearing your voice and listening to your stories and your books were there so we could pick it up and look through. Um, some of the things that I, I really like, can I just tell you about what I like about it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this flattened bamboo on the outside. That's is unique to so that area, unique. actually. It's a special what? thing that you find in, in all the old Ia houses. And um, they actually, uh, they, they sort of crack the bamboo and then split it open and then braise it over a fire so that the outer surface is sort of half burnt, right? It's like yakisugi, except it's yakitake. <laughs> yeah, because I've seen yakisugi and uh, yeah. our old house needs some new wood on the... Yeah sunny mm. side and i yeah. thought this flattened bamboo is such a nice technique is it used in other parts of japan or just i, I can't think where i've ever else seen it except in ia it's really so it, it's cool quite an ia tradition yeah and, and it's what? yeah it's put on to the to the wet plaster and then tied with bamboo uh, uh, with straw rope and so you can actually when you get up close to it you can see the knots of where the water a rope has been tied. Wonderful. And I was reading in uh, Lost Japan how you were talking about uh, decorating and putting furniture in and finding old Try. antiques and stuff <laughs> and then taking it out and having a minimalist. Yeah. And we really felt that when we were staying there. It was like you're staying in a theater. Yeah, you it is. It's a like, nice stage. Yeah, yeah, you feel like someone should be performing. It's so and beautiful. We, we have had wonderful performances there. We've had a flamenco dancer. Uh, we've had Koto and Shakuhachi and Nihonbuyo, no drama, because it's pretty much the shape of a no stage. Uh, we've had a, a cello. A, a, a guy came up, brought his cello, you know. Uh, uh, we've had Thai dance. Uh, we've had uh, quite a variety uh, jazz festivals. No, that room lends itself. It is a theater. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. And there were lots of um, heaters around, and uh, we we also had the irori uh, fires going, and it was so warm and comfortable. And I noticed there were no coolers. So I think probably in summer it's quite cool in this house. You don't oh, need the coolers. Is well. That right? Uh, actually, in in you know there are those two little bedrooms that can be closed off, uh -huh. right? Those are in the old days. All these houses had what they called a nema, which is the bedroom, which are tiny, and have a little roof over them. And there's actually in those rooms there are air conditioners that yeah. come in from the ceiling. So okay, if, you hot, if you need if you need it, but but it's so rare because the house is cool in the summer and and. One of the things about thatch is that it's full of moisture, right? And so the hotter the sun gets, the more moisture evaporates, which means that it cools the house. So literally, the hotter the day, the cooler it's going to be inside. It, it's really a very sort of ergo dynamic. <laughs> that thatch was amazing. Like just being there and looking at the thatch and how thick it was. And then your nearby neighbors, everybody has the steel roofs. Yeah, the, so it you know, was really the only thatch roof in the area that we saw. All, although, ironically, all those other houses, the thatch is still there. They don't take away the thatch, usually. They just put the tin on top of it. And so if you took it off, you'd see the thatch. And if you went inside those houses and looked up, except they've all put in ceilings, you know, so that you don't see it. But, it, but if you were to lift away those ceilings, you'd look up and you'd see the same thing you see in Chiori. It's just that from outside, it's tin, Yeah. Uh, and I love the floor lamps. I know this is one of your special features. It's um, a trademark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that you you've actually done one of your videos about uh, the special feature andon. of the floor lamps. They're gorgeous. They're called andon, and I think they're among the most beautiful things ever created in old Japan. And as I explain in that 
little YouTube I did in my Secrets of Things YouTube, they're, they're, it's very subtle. They're actually not entirely straight. There's a slight bend inwards. So, so they're, instead of being perfectly straight, they're slightly conical, very slightly. And the, the naked, eye won't, naked eye won't see it, but it creates this elegance. There's a, a, just a slight elegant look to them. And that, that idea or that uh, design was created 400 years ago. So beautiful. And because all the wooden floors are, are so clean and glossy, shiny, uh, yeah. you get all those beautiful reflections from the lanterns. Yes. I love well, that. Well, that's because the floors are, are matsu, red pine, and pine has a lot of sap in it. And, so it and, and, and that's why pine was favored for floors in the old days in all old houses. And it, it's because it's always smooth and shiny. Nice. And uh, nearby, we found a beautiful little shrine. Right up and I, I got really lucky with this sunbeam hitting mm -hmm. at the perfect point. It's so beautiful. What a gorgeous shot. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was lucky. Yeah, really magical little area. And so quiet. The stars at night were oh, unbelievable. You can reach out and touch them. Yeah. yeah. So um, to, we talked about Chiodi a lot um, in the last talk. Today, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of your ideas from the book about Kyoto and over tourism. And then we're going to talk about some of your other remodel projects in other areas of Japan to mm. give people an idea of, of a better way forward. I think. Mm. How does that sound? Uh, yes, let's go with it. All right, let's go. Um, so in Lost Japan, uh, we were talking about lamps earlier. You were talking about the brightness factor that a lot of uh, Japanese people really dislike dark places mm. and they go for the fluorescence. And oh, so yeah. you were saying, please, not fluorescence. <laughs> um, you can find more stylish lights like, yeah. like you've done with the lamps. Well, I think that it's a reaction to the old lifestyle. Because the thing about these houses, Chiori, we have really preserved a lot of that mysterious darkness because Chiori is an exception. It's a, it's a remarkable house and of a certain era, hundreds of years older than all the others. Nevertheless, the fact is, uh, as uh, a friend of mine once said, living in an old Japanese house is like being underwater. You know, you're in this kind of <laughs> gloom and <laughs> finding your way through it. Uh, and there, you really, when I do, do the houses, uh, the other houses, it's even in Chiori, we brought in light, a lot of light with those glass doors and so on. But the other houses, we go further than that. We have skylights, all sorts of things that we can do to lighten them up because darkness is the problem. Yeah, that so said, the, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that you were saying is that that's why people in Kyoto might say, we don't want to live in a museum. We don't want to live in the old style. Mm. Why should we have to? And you're saying, well, you don't have to. No, you, don't. you can keep the aesthetic, but make it more modern and comfortable, yeah. right? Which is what Europe's been doing for a century, right? So people live in these medieval houses, but inside they've got Wi-Fi and proper heating and cooling and nice lighting and all they do all those things. So Japan had got into this idea that it was uh, live miserably, live in misery in the old house or tear it down and build something in plastic and chrome. There was no in between. And of course there is, you, you can preserve what's wonderful about these houses and actually make them comfortable. And so that's, that's something we've really worked on. Yeah. Uh, another tip that you had for people thinking about uh, buying an old house and renovating is first taking off all of the sliding doors, the fusuma, the shoji, yes. and seeing the big space because yes. there is a big, beautiful space, but it's often blocked off into little rooms, right? Exactly. And then you might want to put them back in, but at least figure out what the space is. And so that's crucial. And another thing is, uh, don't be afraid of a column in the middle of the room. It's yeah. beautiful. We use the column. Um, we actually knocked down one of the walls that were built in our old yeah. house. You and need we to get rid of the one walls. Of the beams. Yeah. yeah, we kept one of the beams in the middle and made a really convenient counter. Yeah. So as long as you have a bit of creative thinking, you can yeah. still use uh, the structure, right? Oh, completely. And the beams are very beautiful in their own right, or the pillars, I mean, actually. 
And a pillar in the middle of the room is something that Palladio did, you know, in Italy. Th this is not, again, people are sort of afraid of it. They're not used to it. They think a door or something has to go up to it, but it doesn't. And so uh, you, you can be creative with it. Um, now, you one of the things that you bring up in your books, of course, which is one of the pet peeves of many of us who have lived in Japan for a long time, uh, the lack of buried wires. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and That's then you give the example of house tembosh and amusement parks. And when you go to amusement parks in Japan, they often have buried wires. And yeah. so you have this enhanced feeling of being somewhere wonderful. Why don't we do that in beautiful places in yeah. Japan, right? Well, it was one of these policies that got, it's like so many others that got stuck in 1953 or whatever it was when they decided that uh, we were going to prioritize industrial development and so on and no frills. And so burying uh, phone uh, utility lines was just not considered. And then it got established in policy. And so never again could you bury in a utility line. They've just started in the last few years. And, and by the way, one of the big um, people pushing this is the governor of Tokyo, Koike-san. She's, uh, I've actually, she's invited me to come and speak at her uh, committees and so on on this subject. And she's contributed to books on it and all this stuff. And she is burying utility lines in the center of Tokyo like crazy. So Tokyo is actually moving due to her. The other cities, sadly, not so much. Kyoto, you know, has taken its first little baby steps, but hardly. And sadly, most regional towns just don't do it. Uh, but when they do, it's wonderful. Uh, Koyasan did something rather creative. They didn't have the money to bury them. So they moved them away from the street into the back lots on either side. The lines are still there, but it's not quite such an eyesore. So again, you can be creative with this if you don't have the budget to actually bury them. But you know, one of my uh, things that I go around saying on the subject of public works, as you know, I wrote a book talking about how public works have been so destructive to Japan. But one of the points that I want to make is that I'm not opposed to public works. Japan is addicted to that. Uh, the country would go into an economic tailspin if they stopped putting money into these things. So fine, let's continue to do the public works, but do the ones that help the country. So we don't need more roads and dams and bridges and, and fortified uh, rivers and all that stuff that's so destructive. But we do need buried utility lines, restored old cityscapes, proper sewage actually that hasn't reached the whole country, proper water treatment hasn't reached the whole country. You can keep people in hard hats busy for decades using all those government slush funds just by shifting the money to where it would be useful. So uh, there, there's a lot that Japan can actually be doing, but unfortunately it doesn't because the funds are locked into the old system where every, you know, a typical town in Japan every year gets X million dollars or, or many tens of millions of dollars that are earmarked for roads. And that's it. They don't need the roads, but they've got to spend it. <laughs> Yeah, so often you have these beautiful roads that kind of go to nowhere or in the middle of nowhere and they're yeah. beautiful, well-constructed roads and you're thinking, do they really need a four-lane yeah. highway they're, they're, here? They're beautiful in the sense that they're nicely paved and so on. They're not so beautiful in the sense that they've destroyed mountains and rivers uh, to, to produce it and, and built incredible concrete embankments on both sides and all that so that it's actually environmentally quite destructive at the same time. I, I was sad driving into Chiori, uh, your beautiful valley, and I was trying to imagine what it was like when you first yeah. went there without all the construction and all the concrete. Yeah. And yeah. So Ia yeah. is full of it, as is every valley in Japan. And in fact, the more remote, the more concrete junk you'll see because they depended more on the government largesse. So it's, it's sad and it's so unnecessary because IA actually needs those government funds to do other things. Uh, but anyway, yeah. such is the system. I, I we, need to, a, we need I went to the rural, rural town of Mitarai uh, ah, the yeah. other day. That's wonderful, isn't it? I've it been is. there. It's, that's really a kind of never, never land, isn't it? It was just um, a backdrop yeah. of a movie, Japanese movie oh, really? called Drive My Car. 
Uh And uh, it was where he was staying in the movie. And I had recently interviewed someone from there. So it was a great chance to go and revisit. It's Mm -hmm. been a while. It's a very special place. Yes. No, it's kind of the end of the world. It's, It's out there in the middle of the Inland Sea. Nobody ever heard of it. Nobody ever goes there. And it's in pretty much perfect condition. You know, it's it's have, exactly have what it's exactly what you were saying. There there is definitely some funding that they could use. Uh, yeah. There's some beautiful old temples and shrines which are falling apart. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be nice to see some public money going into restoring certain areas of that. Instead, it'll go into building a sparkling enormous bridge or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, let's talk about Kyoto. You mm-hmm. have a whole chapter on Kyoto in Dogs and mm-hmm. Demons, uh, which I reread before this talk today because I think it's still, even though it was written 20 years ago, yeah. it is still so relevant. Oh, yeah. Do you sometimes think back and think, wow, it really didn't change, it got worse? Has anything gotten better since you wrote Dogs well, and Demons? Actually, I've considered uh, doing a kind of updated Dogs and Demons. And I did do, uh, uh, there's now a paperback version came out just five or six years ago and I wrote a new preface for it. And in that I said, you know, there are some chapters that are no longer really so relevant such as the banking collapse. It's history, it's kind of fascinating history and it took Japan 30 years to get over the, the, the mismanagement, but they are over it now. That's really not today's story. And another thing that changed hugely was tourism. So when I wrote Dogs and Demons, Japan was, I think, 33rd in the world or something like that, behind Tunisia. You know, nobody came. I sat there in Kameoka, and the cobwebs grew on my telephone. You know, nobody came to Japan. Fast forward until COVID, we had this explosion of inbound tourism, and it was just getting started, right? They went from, you know, 4 million to 10 million to 20 million, 30 million. They were headed to 40. COVID hit. And, and they'll come back once COVID calms down. It'll take a while, but Japan's once again going to be uh, uh, on the upward uh, spiral there, which is very good. And so tourism had tremendously good effects. I'm saying all this in advance of talking of the bad effects, but it had, uh, uh, for one thing, it saved a lot of rural areas that were going under. Places like Ia now can only really survive with tourism because agriculture and forestry are just finished. So tourism is the angel sent from heaven that can save Japan's rural areas. And it also, of course, helped Kyoto, which is not economically in great shape either. Even Tokyo benefited, as New York and other huge capital cities have a surprisingly big percentage of their GNP is tourism driven. it had another good, great effect, which was cultural, because it sort of forced Japan to open up in a lot of ways. People started learning English more than they used to. They started, uh, ho- uh, ryokans and hotels began to provide services that they never would have provided to the Japanese because they were locked into that old hospitality mentality, which traditionally in Japan, it's provider oriented, right? So the provider sets the rules And you're, as a guest or or a user, you're just, you passively enjoy it, right? And when you go to a ryokan, it's this wonderful system and they bring tea to your room and they change the bed and everything. But if you ask for one little thing that's not on that menu, then panic ensues, right? And no, we can't do that. Well, that changed because now they had to deal with the foreigners and they learned they could deal with them. And they began to, uh, people began to take courses and study and hire managers that had studied abroad and all that kind of thing. And so hospitality in Japan made a big leap forward. And the other thing that, that where it was beneficial was design, because you were talking about fluorescent lights. Well, until the foreigners started coming, it was only the domestic market, which meant that everything was built of bright white marble and, and chandeliers and fluorescent light, right? Foreigners didn't want that. They wanted variations in light and darkness, organic, you know, wood, uh, spotlighting, all that kind of, it's, it's a technology of lighting, which now Japan has acquired. And Japan has now wonderful designers. There are people that are doing beautiful things in hotels in Ryokan, and they were not doing it before this 
big flood of foreign tourists. So culturally, this thing has been really, people always talk about the economic benefit of it, but there's also been a huge cultural benefit. You have a great example uh, of a uh, guest talking to a hotel staff in Dogs and Demons at the end of the Kyoto chapter, uh, where he, the guest is saying, you've showed me so many wonderful things, but where can I see the views of Mount Fuji? Where can I see the traditional sites? And the hotel staff is thinking, I need to study English. I must be misunderstanding, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because what's left, sadly, after all the years of environmental degradation and, and zero protection for the old city of Kyoto and all the other cities, is that what you have now are, are particular sites, the famous temple, and it's behind walls, and it's in gorgeous condition. But the minute you walk out of that wall, then it's pachinko parlors and boxy houses. And, and so the city, the, the environment for those places is degraded and gone. And so you won't find uh, the 53 stations of the Tokaido. You can travel them and you might find here and there a restaurant that survives or a famous inn that somehow miraculously resisted the destruction. But the town that you go through is going to look like all the others. And so that's Japan's modern tragedy. Yeah. Um, you, you gave a quote from Basho even when in Kyoto, I long for Kyoto. Mm. And that was many years ago. And I, when I visit Kyoto, I feel like that. And I, I get frustrated with tourism promotion for Japan that always promotes the over-touristed yes. areas. It yeah. always promotes Kyoto. It always promotes Miyajima. Yeah. Um, and I always think, please stop promoting them. There yeah, are yeah. too many people going. Well, the, the, okay, now we get to the over-tourism story. So, so far I talked about the good side. I also wrote a book in Japanese called Kanko uh, Bo uh, Kokuron. Kanko Rikoku has been the big catchphrase. There it is. And that means destroying the country with tourism. The catchphrase had been Kanko Rikoku, which means building up the country with tourism. And I'm talking now about the, 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 the minus side. And every industry has toxic byproducts. So tourism does too. It doesn't mean tourism is a bad thing. Like I say, I'm in favor of it. I think Japan needs it. We want more of it. We can double the number of tourists and it can still be beneficial. So it's not about the numbers. It's about how it's managed. And so this book really talks about how to manage tourism. And of course, one of the ways is exactly what you've just talked about has to do with tourist promotion. And for example, the uh, National Tourist Ministry, whatever it's called, of, of uh, the Netherlands, has taken their tourism budget and cut PR out of it entirely because the whole world is gonna go to Amsterdam anyway. They don't need to advertise Amsterdam. They've figured that out. The gold pavilion, you need to have a poster or a website advertising the gold pavilion. <laughs> you know, it's like Italy saying, you know, there's this place you haven't heard of called Michelangelo's David, right? Uh, or the Louvre or something. You don't need to do the PR. So the PR needs to be done intelligently, spot so that you send people to places like Ia or Okayama or Kyushu or or and, and not to not to the famous skiing place in Hokkaido, but all the other wonderful places in Hokkaido that they don't know about. That's re that would be really well managed tourist PR, but of course it doesn't happen. <laughs> Or, or if you really want to get to those really famous sites, uh, let's encourage people to go there early or later in the day, not when everybody else is going. Well, or let's let's make areas like you talk about zoning or regulation. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. let's make areas where it's pedestrian only, for Absolutely. example, or buses, tour buses aren't allowed in or something. Oh yeah, well, park on the well, outside. Yeah, one of the huge paradigm shifts, I actually at one time thought of writing a, a book called A New Philosophy of Tourism, and I never got around to it, but but I have some critical ideas for it, and one of them has to do... Never with, too late, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it has to do with two sides, the, the providers, that, that is the temples and the towns that have tourists coming to them. And the other side is us, where we decide to go, right? And, and so, for example, a place that I know is being damaged by over-tourism is a place that I should probably not go to. 
So I've, I've always wanted to go to the Galapagos. Now I probably will not go. It's because I'll, the Galapagos will be better off if people like me don't go. So I would like to go to the place that really needs me, right? Which might be some little town in Ecuador or something like that, assuming I ever travel again. <laughs> so getting back to uh, this, this kind of paradigm shift, until now, it's always been assumed that tourist sites should, should be open freely to all. It, they can't be. The famous ones are beyond that. The, the overcapacity line has been crossed. And so that means that we're going to enter a stage, like it or not, where some people can go and some people can't go. And how do you then manage that? For example, you can raise entry fees, which is one idea. Not All of these have plus and minuses. That is maybe not so good because it's younger people or people with less economic uh, facilities can't go. Uh, but anyway, that's one way. But because one, you do have a lot of places that are like practically free and people go just because it's free. And you'll find that if they had to spend just a little money, they won't go. And that's the advantage of that. Well, that's one way. Another way is reservation systems. So Japanese museums, it's a horror story. They're lined up, uh, you know, 10 and 15 people deep. And first of all, it's three hours before you get in. And there are people with bullhorns. And you can't even see the art because you're standing behind the 20 people. If you go to the Borghese in Rome, one of the great museums of the world, it's you apply in advance on the internet. You, you reserve a place and a time. You go, it's quiet. You have it to yourself. You can enjoy it. Now, that means a lot of people will not be able to go to the Borghese. <coughs> The advantage of these approaches is that it, by definition, it means the people that really want to go will go. And the people, the Chutohampa people, who only went because it was famous and they don't really care about it in the first place or because it was free, they won't go. And that raises the level of your visitors. So it means the quality of people who come is higher because they're the people who cared. And the other ones will overflow and can go to the huge open places and they can go to the Disneylands or whatever, and it's fine. And they won't know the difference. Yeah, there has to be a balance with some mass tourism sites where mainstream tourists want to go. But you're right, the really special places, we want people who go there to appreciate it and to get a lot out of it for them as well as for the locals who are taking care of it, right? And, and even when you're talking about the mainstream places, another there are so many ways to do it. Another way is simply capacity limits. So many people are allowed in per day. So the early worm wins, yeah. right? That's one way to handle it. Uh, there, it, it. There's quite a kind of variety of approaches to these things. You, you know, Shirakawa, the famous thatched roof village, has a, an autumn viewing season when they light them up and it's very popular. And they instituted several years ago a reservation system for entering the village. But of course they're well situated because they're in this valley and you can only get in and out by one road. <laughs> so they can do it. I mean, Kyoto wouldn't be able to do something like that. Uh, but it's doable for a place like Shirakawa. Yeah. I, Another, there's, an there's a bunch of different approaches worth uh, trying, right? Uh, another approach is what they did at Stonehenge in England, which, is, you know, the, the Japanese sites are cluttered with horrible tour buses and all that stuff. And there's this built-in kind of default idea that bendy, which means convenience, right? That if places are not bendy, people won't go. Well, in England, they took the tour buses and the guest, the, the, the welcome lodges and all that stuff and they move them two kilometers away and you have to you can either walk or take a little cart to Stonehenge over these fields where there's sheep and so on and when you get there you feel oh you know the ancient druids right it's been well choreographed so that all the noise and the crowds and everything are stopped two kilometers away like and, pe and people are happy to do it and Right now, there are literally hundreds of European cities who are shutting cars out from their downtowns. So Kyoto could, could literally close a number of its big streets. And that, again, would 
even so you could have more people coming but it would feel less crowded and would be more friendly and would also benefit the shopkeepers because instead of just driving through on your big bus if you're walking you'll stop to see the interesting thing that's being sold or you'll go into the coffee shop and so they found that it's the opposite of this japanese idea that if it's bendy it kills the economy making people walk that is a little bit of not bendy right actually benefits the shopkeepers yeah i i like that idea um having uh parking areas a little bit outside so they walk into yeah. the historical areas and yeah. they actually have a sense of excitement because there's a little bit of waiting involved psychologically that works right yeah, yeah. uh so and because it opens areas up right, without the cars and the buses and everything, it expands the space available for the crowds of people that, that are coming. So again, uh, you can have more people and less congestion. Yeah. Even in um, Tokyo, in Ginza, the, uh, once a week, they yeah. were closing the center uh, yes. to cars and just putting tables and chairs out in the middle of the street. I think and they still they do it, don't they? This beautiful open space for people to enjoy. I believe they're still doing it. I'm not sure about that, but I love that. And it was a huge success. So, and Ginza found that they could close their streets on the weekend and it just made no difference to the traffic. But the people, and well, Broadway does it now. I don't know if you know that there are seven blocks of Broadway that are just permanently closed off. That's uh, great. Yeah. And again, it didn't kill New York traffic. Uh, Broadway was a weird street anyway that kind of didn't work because it's diagonal. And they found that by not having cars on Broadway, it actually benefited the traffic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Frank on Facebook saying about Venice. Yes. Venice is tackling its over-tourism yes. pro uh, problem. Uh, I saw that they're limiting the amount of people that can go in at one yeah. time. And yeah. making sure that they stay the night. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that's, uh, by the way, a big issue that I'd written about in my tourism book uh, is something that's called, and Venice suffered from this, something called zero dollar tourism. Yeah. And what that is, <laughs> it, the, the concept came up originally with Chinese tours where they booked a tour in Shanghai and then they come to, it, came, it was started in Australia and they stay in a Chinese hotel and they use Chinese buses and all, they pay with Alipay. Not, not one yuan of it ever enters Australia. So on paper, it looks great. We got 100,000 visitors from China this week, but in fact, it was zero dollars for Australia. But the concept is broader than just this tour agency issue. Uh, big cruise tours are like that, right? They come to the dock. This has happened in Venice. They come to the dock. They, of course, they eat and sleep on the boat. So what do they do? They get off the dock, they walk through Venice, they use the toilets, they throw away their trash, uh, and by the way, the city ended up found that they were in the red when it came to supplying electricity and water and so on to the boats. And a lot of the sewage is dumped by the, the cruise ships. The sewage ship and all this damage well. caused, <laughs> and it was zero dollar because the people on those tour boats don't spend their money in Venice. Negative, negative yeah. dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it was negative dollar. It was worse than zero dollars. So Venice is now cracking down on on those cruise cruise uh, ships. But also, it's a wonderful idea to make sure that people have to stay in a hotel. I love that. Because the, a, day tripper, the day trippers are the zero yeah. dollar people. Yeah. There's a simple idea Mitarai is putting into place now. Yeah. Uh, there's one toll bridge on the way over, which is 700 yen. Yeah. But if you spend 1,000 yen in the town, and they're all local shops, yeah. Yeah. Um, then you show your receipt to the Ooh. tourist office, and you okay. get a free toll back. Okay, that's so a great that was nice. That's a good deal. And that will that it's not only the amount that people spend, it gets into their head that they should spend. Yeah. It's conceptual. And so that's a that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Nice simple idea. Yeah. Um now another part of uh dogs and demons talking about Kyoto. You're you're talking about the foreigners' exotic dreams, seeking out mystical Japan. Oh, so, yeah. in some ways, even though it's not all traditional Kyoto like they expect, they somehow accept it. And yeah. then the small things they do find, they're like, "Oh, we found it. Yeah. That's enough." And and they're very angry if you point out 
that there's any problem because it 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 sort of puts a crack into their dream. And so uh, what, what I've written, uh, <clears throat> what, what we find is that the people that have been in Japan in a long time adore dogs and demons. The people that are fresh off the boat and uh, uh, hate me and they think, how can you say these awful anti-Japanese things, you know, uh, when they don't realize that the book is in Japanese and that the Japanese love this book. The Japanese love the book and the foreigners that have been there a long time. But the ones that have just arrived are, don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. It's deeply disturbing, it, and it sort of is, is offends, offends the Japanese romance that they've built up in their minds. So it's a problem because I believe that the more foreigners that honestly see it for what it is, and show that or say it, will have a benefit, have an impact on Japan. But as long as you have people saying the city Kyoto is the most beautiful city in the world and all this stuff, and it isn't. Then, and then that leads Japan to be lackadaisical. Okay, why should we bury uh, utility lines? Why shouldn't we destroy more shop houses? The foreigners love it anyway. So I, 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 it's almost like they're lending their hands to the, this romantic approach, lends its hand to the destruction. If you really loved Old Kyoto, and if you were really filled with the romance of Old Kyoto, as I believe I am, then it would upset you. <clears throat> and Continuing on the idea that uh, some foreigners who are very deeply invested in protecting and preserving and continuing a lot of Japanese traditions are kind of like you said about the, the visitors, the inbound visitors also being very positive for preserving culture in a way yeah. because they appreciated it. A lot of the uh, international long-term residents who are going back to the traditional ways of making sake or yes. building houses because yes. they see the value, the appeal of it is also having a positive effect. I love yeah. that idea. And actually, well, I've said that the, these sort of people off the boat, people have this romance and there's a downside in that they're, they're, they're wearing these shades. But the upside is that they do love and appreciate old Japan. And they will, many of them nowadays, go out of their way to find these extraordinary places and craftsmen and so on. And so there is that good side, that, that, that's the, that romantic approach is an engine of curiosity. Uh, so of course it, it has its upside. Yeah. Um, so do you, would you say that's still very relevant um, even though you wrote that 20 years ago? I would say so. Oh yeah, well, so back to what's relevant with what isn't. Uh, so the chapter on nuclear misinformation and so on is completely relevant. It practically predicts Fukushima. Uh, the chapter on uh, Kyoto is very relevant. They're still tearing down old houses. Uh, in fact, uh, and the public works chapters and all of that, it, it could be written yesterday. It needs very little updating. Uh, the chapters on the banking and tourism would be very different now because Japan is in the limelight there's a, a pent-up demand of people now that want to come back to Japan. Once COVID settles down, we're going to have another a tsunami of tourists, right? And that's okay, as long as Japan is prepared for it and manages it, has systems in place. And what I fear is that they won't be, that, that now it's just desperate. We just want the numbers, get them. We want those people back, whatever, you know. And so we'll have the same problems we had before. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned also uh, in 1980, 13,000 places were listed as historical monuments by the Architectural Society. A third had already disappeared. I imagine that number is much higher. Oh, now. yeah. Well, they get torn down every day. Uh, a friend of mine in Kamioka who, who bought a Kominka and fixed it up, a little one, very charming. And uh, he just sent me a photo. He said, you know, it, this just this week, this house down the street got torn down. It was a lovely old thatched house. It had tin on it, but it's, you know, one of those houses. You could see the tractor in front of it about to tear it down. And then he said, and there was a really beautiful one up in the hill. Oh, they're tearing that one down too. It's happening daily everywhere uh, because the, the mechanisms of protecting these places are so weak. Another reason to be excited about the Minka Summit 
Uh, you said 90% in the last talk, 90% of all of the old houses are being torn down. It's only 10% which are being restored or renovated in Japan. That's an incredible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it 10%. No. Less than less? 1%. Less than 1%. Yeah. Uh, so, no, it's nowhere near, we're not anywhere near the 10% level. Oh. Which, which is still, it's precious. It's, it's, it's amazing now that there is this new interest in Kominka and the, the Akia banks, you know, Akia means abandoned house, right? And the uh, hundreds of regional towns in Japan now have these things called Akia Banku, right? Which is basically a website where you can find out about houses that people aren't living in anymore. And the city will help you negotiate to buy, buy or rent them. And it, it, there's a huge variation, and some of the towns are, are extremely advanced in their thinking and extre very helpful, and they make the whole process easy. And others, you get into the bureaucratic quagmire. <laughs> you know, there's 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 a range, but still, it means that houses that were never available before now are. And Japanese, and it's not only the foreigners; the Japanese are are uh, kind of cashing in on this too. Yeah. Well, so that you, means that hundreds of yeah. houses around Japan are being saved that would not have been. Well, let's talk about some of the projects that you are involved with. Uh, now, we talked a lot about uh, Chiori last time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the others. Here's Yamaura Stay. Yes. Now, Do you know, you know Yamaura the was... Projects, the projects um, that you directly manage are in the Shigoku and Kagawa area? Yes, and yes. Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones are managed by the regions, but yeah. you have trained them. Oh, so yeah. So you're spreading your knowledge wider, even though you're not directly managing all of them, right? No. Yamaura, I'm so sad about because it was completed in March of 2020, <laughs> you know, right at the moment that COVID struck. And so I have not seen the completed buildings yet. Oh, it looks gorgeous. And it's gorgeous. These are the most stunning houses. This part of Nagano uh, has very, very large houses with enormous, look at the Daikoku Bashira, the huge column on the left there. These massive columns and eaves, the, the roofs stick out way li like a good 20 feet outside the house. They're really grand. Uh, these houses were a joy, and and we had a the right kind of budget to do them very very nicely. So uh, I'm dying to go back myself, and rec and it's easy to get to from Tokyo. So anyone who's in Tokyo, I recommend you go here. And it's and, and the village uh, that uh, three of the houses are are in a, um, a a really charming village that you can walk around. Well, they're all in charming villages, but one especially charming one. Yeah. No, this I is a magical that. place. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so when you do the training, can you give us some insight about how you prepare them yeah. to manage these places? Well, there are two things going on here. One is in the actual planning of the houses. It's there are really, uh, you know, there's the basic things that the, the kind of the, the step one of it is how to preserve what's beautiful about the house and then bring in the comforts. But then there's step two and step three. Step two is how to make them function as a business. And there are all these issues such as privacy. People will not stay anymore in a house where you've got to walk through somebody else's room to get to the toilet. So where's your corridor? How do you, how do you, are, are, should the rooms be lockable or not? How do, how do you, uh, how do you arrange where the toilets are? All these sorts of issues. One of the rules that I'm always fighting in Japan, this is one of the fights with local architects. I will never have a toilet with no window. They want to build these, you know, dark, walled toilets somewhere. No, toilets must have a window. They must have air and light, stuff like that. Light, um, uh, how do people check in? What's the ent entrance and exit to the house? Uh, which rooms should be Japanese style rooms with futons and which might have beds? This is in Kameoka, by the way. 
where would we have chairs and where would you have sofas and where would they sit on the floor? These are all have issues. These are kind of critical issues because modern travelers, which is not just the foreigners, a lot of Japanese won't sit on the floor anymore, right? They want their chairs and tables. On the other hand, a beautiful tatami room like this, you're not going to put a bed in it, right? So, so you, there are the, those issues. Then kind of the last issue, uh, which has to do with, and, and this is, very subjective, but it's it's really my intense focus, which is the beauty of it. And, and the beauty of it has to do with, uh, you have to have lived in, in an old house like this for a long time and experienced them and, and have a feeling for where things go. And it's, it's remarkable. It's kind of like a tea room almost. You know, if you move that jar in the tokonoma three centimeters to the left, it will be slightly more beautiful. There are very, very delicate things that will raise it from being nice to that thing that makes your heart leap up, like we have in Chiori, right? And that's the other element that we try to bring to these houses. Like this. I love that. Just yeah. very simple. You've yeah. got a few antiques um, that people Those can enjoy. Rocks. Gorgeous. Rocks. <laughs> Some rocks. But it does the trick. It does it. It brings you home and it tells you where you are. I love it. And uh, oh, this was nearby the the vine bridge. The, the vine bridge. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Ojika. We didn't mm -hmm. have a chance to talk about Ojika, and that's a really interesting project in the Goto Islands in Nagasaki, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, Ojika, I think of it as the Ia of the sea, because it's it's extremely remote and hard to get to. And another thing is that Ia, because it was so remote, that's where the Heike refugees, after the Heike wars, the Heike Genji wars, the Heike fled into Ia, right? Well, Ojika was so remote that this is where the hidden Christians went. And so there's, there's still an old Christian church there. And these houses, which are some, some of them quite grand, um, were all abandoned. And we did eight houses there. And they're among, I think, the most beautiful that I've been able to do so far. Quite a range. And uh, there are two islands that make up the kind of Ojika Cho. One is this, uh, the main island where people are living. And then the other island, which is abandoned and where the Christians had been and where their old church is. That's very mystical because there's nobody there anymore. And so you take a little boat over to the other island and suddenly it's kind of post-apocalyptic because the village is there, but no people. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating place to go. Plus there's, there's uh, you know, kayaking and hiking and it's just good beaches, it's got everything. I love all the woodwork, all the exposed beams. Yeah, oh, the these, were, these, these are wonderful houses. And we had wonderful wood to work with, including some old wood. And we put in, for example, wooden decks sometimes on the outside. Uh, there was always this choice about what to move and what to keep, but like this wonderful stairways, the kind of thing that gets removed often because they're so steep. But I just, you know, you have to keep it. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And the guns, some of them have these amazing, the hoshu. Hoshu, yes. this one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, now this was a samurai house and very grand, and it actually had huge hundreds, uh, like a old, I don't know what they call it, it's a kind of palm, but they lived to be hundreds of years old. Um, and there they have those planted old trees. We kept absolutely every tree that we possibly could. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, so Ojiko is very special because you really, uh, it's actually a very ancient place. It, it's named in the Kojiki and Nihongi, those eighth century chronicles, because the, the, there was what they called the Kentoshi, who were the ambassadors that went from the Nara court to Chang'an, to China, the imperial capital of China. And Ojika was their last stop. Oh, can you hold this photo for a second? Um, one of the things that I did for the first time here, and I've done it now in other houses, is a sunken living room. And this has been so popular. 
uh, almost too much. People spent, they, I was hoping they would spend their time in the Zashki, the big, beautiful tatami room, but instead everybody gathers in this nice, comfy, kind of sunken living room. Where did you get this idea? It's such a great idea. You know, uh, this is a, a little bit of a digression, but there was a group of houses in Misaki, which is south of uh, Tokyo, south of Kamakura, on the Miura Peninsula, where an American photographer back in the 50s had built a, a, a bunch of villas called the Misaki Houses. And my parents rented one of those, and we used to go there. And it turns out that the founder of, of the Amon Resort Group, Adrian Zeka, used to rent one too in the 50s and 60s. And he later has said that his Amon resorts were inspired by those houses. And me too, I was a 12 year old boy, but they had uh, this uh, wonderful mix between Japanese timbers, Japanese columns, they had shoji doors, but he, they also had these kind of 60s ranch house uh, 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 style with sunken living rooms and so on. And so that's where I got it. I really literally went back to childhood, but it wasn't American sunken living rooms. It was the Misaki houses. Yeah. I love it. What a great design. You've used this in a few of your remodel houses, right? I have ever since this was the first one. And then I've now done it in Ia. We also did it in the Yamaura stay in Nagano. Gorgeous. Is it a hard decision uh, to keep the tatami or to have beds? It's it's always an issue. And in a number of the late, more recent houses that we've done, we have both. So we'll have a tatami room and a room with a bed, if we can, if it's big enough for that. Now, speaking of uh, having a place that feels like a museum, one of the more interesting places is in Fukui. It's an old doctor's house. Yes. Yeah. No, oh, that was a wonderful building and with a kura in the back that, that has great charm. And the little street that it's on, it's in, a, it's in a town called Sakai Minato, which was one of the important, there it is, one of the important ports on the, on the, the shipping route that went along the Japan Sea. And here we actually, uh, they, they were quite a wealthy household and all these antiques and old medical signs and things came out of it and we were able to use them as decoration in our, we, we opened up the ceiling and created a kind of, a, of an atrium effect, but we kept the surrounding uh, ledge and put those pieces up there. Yeah, really interesting. And the, the man who runs it is a bonsai artist. And so if you go to the house, you can also visit his bonsai shop. And he does, oh, there they are, the most beautiful things. Beautiful. Yeah, I interviewed a place in Tokyo, the Hapoen, where they have oh, yeah, yeah. beautiful old 100-year-old bonsai trees. Looks oh, gorgeous. Hapoen was a great mansion, you know. It's really one of the last of the Tokyo mansions. I used to I used to rent uh, when I was in college. I rented a little four and a half mat room, <laughs> not far from Hapoen. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those really long running businesses. They're doing yeah. a great job, even still. Yes. You know, wonderful. So they survived when all the others went under, so they deserve great credit. Now this one, I don't think we've talked about this yet. It looks absolutely beautiful. Komachi no Ie? Ah, yes. Well, this is uh, three houses in um, uh, a little town called Utazu, which is on the north shore of Shikoku. And we've actually now, it's sort of three and a half houses. We, we did another little one next door. And uh, th these are among our best selling houses, uh, even though nobody ever heard of Utazu, but it's very near Takamatsu and it's convenient if you're going to. Um, uh, uh Benesse, right? And so, which does not have very good lodging. So there's basically Benesse house and practice into a few guest houses, but it's difficult, right? Uh, so people will often use this as their base because it's just about a 30 minute drive from Takamatsu. It, so it's Kagawa, is it? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you can see in this photo, that's the Seto Ohashi bridge going off that links Okayama and, and Shikoku. Wow, it looks fantastic. And it's two places here in? Three, house, three houses in Utazu. Yeah, there's that's the biggest one. 
So one is is uh, more no, there are two houses. Sorry, two houses, and one of them you can actually break it up with two pairs of guests. So it's really two houses. Sorry, yeah. yeah. And I'm so impressed by your websites. All the pictures are displayed so beautifully. The information's really easy to read as well. Oh, good. Thanks for saying that. And you have all the the pictures are so well taken with all showing the quality of light, the natural light, as well as the the beautiful light at night. I, I've noticed this in all your places. Light, lighting is one of my biggest issues. And you don't want to be too, you don't want to be too dark. You don't want to be too light. And my, my kind of key take on this is you want the parts that should be light should have spot be spotlit and have the light. And you can have these dark corners where you don't need light and that's fine. And the variation then brings out the mood of the house. I love this bedroom up in the rafters. Oh, uh, look at those beams. Yeah, these gorgeous. And they were, can you go back to that one? I don't know if you yeah. can go back. Yep. Uh, okay, that room was really horrible when we found it. Somebody had painted those beams white. <laughs> and so we had to scrape off the white and restore them to their original dark color. Uh, you know, th these things, are, and of course it was filled with garbage. It, it was, this room was a disaster. And look how beautiful it turned, beautifully it turned out. Absolutely gorgeous. And then this, this house has a private, very small garden, but yes. it has a bigger feeling because yes. of the big windows in front of it, but very sure. private from the outside world. That's really well done. Yeah, and privacy is key because, of course, the other house is right next to it. And you don't, and guests really do not want someone looking at them in the bath or in the garden, you know. And so how do you preserve the privacy without being too enclosed? Uh, that These are all these kind of puzzles and challenges when you do these houses. Yeah. What's What's the hardest thing for you to give in on? if you disagree with the designer or something, or do you always your way or the highway? Oh, no, no, it's compromise, compromise, compromise. Uh, one of the issues that, that is, is, is just simply um, building code, for example, earthquake uh, uh, strengthening. And so uh, we often have cases where I want to remove the whole wall and put in glass. And they say, you can't do that because at least this part of it must be clay or must have some kind of wooden reinforcement or something for earthquake reasons. And of course, I, obviously, I would give in on that. And there's give and takes. For example, are you going to have underfloor heating? Are you going to have double pane glass? And one of the key things, are you going to have arumisashi, you know, those aluminum sliding doors, which I really hate. And, you, and they make beautiful glass doors in Japan now with wooden frames, right? So I will give, I'll give up the underfloor heating to have the wooden framed sliding doors, yeah. right? And I would also give up the underfloor heating to have the double paint glass because the, the, uh, that has an uh, incredible impact on keeping it warmer and cooler. Uh, so there, there are all these kinds of gives, give, give and takes. And, it, you know, there's a budget. And you've got to live with it. And, and there are also key things where I would like to keep the room a certain look and so on. But we know that people need their privacy. People will not want to stay in, in, in the room as it had been with no privacy at all. So that means that, for example, this area, which would have made a really nice room, now has to be a corridor. In, and so those are the kind of practical ho hotelier aspect to it. And, and by the way, a lot of people that do these kominka have no clue about that. They, they just want to make them look nice, which, of course, I do, too. But if you're, if you're going to run it as a hotel business, which we're doing with most of them, then these other issues come into play. And so, yeah, there, it's, 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 there are a lot of heartbreaking moments <laughs> when, yeah. when you have to let something go. And then you try to find the beautiful way to do it. Okay, it's going to be a corridor. Mm, how are we going to make this the most beautiful corridor you ever saw? Right? Yeah. 
Well, you've done it for so many years. So is it getting easier because you kind of have it in your mind that these these are the ways to do it? Uh, these are the steps we need to take, that kind of thing? I wish I could say it was easier. I mean, you have an instinct for what should be done, but each house is so different. And the issues you run up against are so unexpected. You know, you you... You, often the first step in these houses is to remove walls and floors and things. And then you discover, oh my God, this whole wing is rotten. <laughs> Back to the drawing board. Uh, so there is no cookie cutter that's going to work for all these places. Yeah. Well, that's, it's like sustainability. It is, you have some standard practices, but it's very case by case and you have to evolve and have different hurdles and challenges and successes every time, right? <laughs> and that's the fun of it. That's the thing about a kominka. It's not a prefab house. Each one has its personality. And they're, and they're, and I have really learned in this process about the different types of houses by region in Japan. I feel like I'd like to write a book about that. Ia houses, for example, that bamboo siding that you liked, you don't find that anywhere else. In Niigata and so on, they're two-storied houses. There's no such thing as a two-story thatched house in, in, for example, in the Kyoto area or in Tokushima. And you and in Niigata, you have these amazing eaves that where the roof comes out way beyond the, the side of the house, which I think was because of the heavy snows. All these things that are really individual and unique, and the shapes of kuras. One of the things, for example, that you, we aren't really shown in those Yamaura stay photos, but a number of these houses have kuras attached to them, which are very distinctive and which are open for the guests to enjoy. And so kura are a subject of their own. How And kura are difficult to use, right? Because they're kind of dark and window, mostly windowless. They're storage houses, basically. They're storage very houses. Very well insulated and yeah. very dark, right? But they're very dark and so on, but they're beautiful and, they can, and they're usable and you can make them into a little coffee space, into a little office, into a little display space. There are all these ways that you can use kura, which are often, which come with the houses, but you can't use the, there's no cookie cutter about that because the kura are different. The Nagano kura are unlike anything you'd ever see in Kyoto, you know. So these regional variations come into play and, and, and it's been fun learning about it. Yeah, that is really fun. Um, can we expect more Alex Kerr projects in the future? Oh, now, oh absolutely. Is resuming? Oh, man, I've got plans. <laughs> uh, there are a number of areas I want to, uh, there's more in IA that I want to do. There's more in, in the Kyoto area that I want to do. Uh, I want, uh, there's Fukushima area. I'm in love with the Minami Aizu area. I mean, they're all over Japan that I, I mean, I'm really gung ho to get going again once we can. Yeah, that's wonderful. And even Utazu, near us, there, there are a couple of fabulous old properties that are just waiting. Uh, and so that's another thing we're working on. Yeah. That's great. Very exciting. Thank you so much, Alex. Another great talk full of great insights. I'm well, sure people thank really you. get a lot out of it. It's just yeah. marvelous to talk to you because you you know how to ask the right questions. <laughs> Yay! So happy. And I can't wait to see you next month at the Minka Summit. That'll see be so you soon. fun. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. We had some great comments and questions today once again. And see you next time.